Vivekan, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of Medtronic Diabetes for taking a time from your busy schedule to attend the webinar. Things will only be better in the future if we do something about it, says Christopher Peterson, professor at the University of Michigan. To help patients predict hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia up to 60 minutes in advance, Medtronic has developed world's first smart real-time CGM. So today we are going to listen to the experts talking about the Guardian Connect system. The talks are the recordings of the symposium conducted at Advanced Technologies and Treatments for Diabetes Conference in Berlin 2019. Let me introduce our speakers for today's webinar. The first speaker is Professor Ohad Cohen. He is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Institute of Endocrinology at Charles Shiba Medical Center and Sackler School of Medicine, Tel Aviv, Israel. He is active in promoting better care of diabetes with the use of technology through research and education of healthcare professionals and patients. Our second speaker is Professor Inge Giles, who is a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of University Hospital, Brussels, Belgium. She is going to present cases where Guardian Connect has helped her to achieve better patient outcomes. With this, let's listen to Professor Ohad Cohen talking about power of prediction. It's a pleasure being here, and I want to discuss a feature that not all of us are fully aware of what it means and what it affects the way that we treat our patients. My name is Ohad Cohen. I'm a professor of endocrinology in Tel Aviv University, and I also serve as the uh, director of medical affairs for the uh, diabetes in Medtronic in uh, Europe, at least in Africa. And let's get straight to the point. Hypoglycemia worries our patients. 25% of the patients living with diabetes has unawareness. They don't even know they are hypoglycemia, which is even worse because they're not worried but it is dangerous for them. The longer you have the diabetes, the more chances of you being hypoglycemia unaware. Just doing SMBGs, you miss a lot. We all know that, that, that four or five times, six times a day, you're gonna miss 288 times uh, uh, measurements that if you do it every five minutes. And most of the patients will point that hypoglycemia is the, the most problematic issue that they have dealing with diabetes and, and preventing them to get to the control that they want to be. So what is the business? What is the problem of treating diabetes? Why is there a major issue in having our patients in well control and safety? And this really is clear here. We believe that we can find the perfect solutions to our patients, that is by looking at previous data, extrapolating it, and trying to find the base, the best basal insulin amount, the best carb ratio for the boluses, we can have the patients treat themselves in the future. But this is right maybe for 25% of the patients, which every day looks the same. But variability is the rule of nature. And not every, and not any two individuals are the same. Not every day is the same. But the same also goes to the glycemic profile. Not, a, not two days have the same glycemic profile of our patients. And this is very clear here. This is a patient, actually a, a patient with diabetes in pregnancy. She usually are best controlled. But what we can learn from here is that if we treat a patient or this patient according to the profile of day one, which we can see that it goes to a low blood glucose at eight o'clock in the morning, probably needs a reduction in the basal insulin. If she wakes up the next day, day two, and after we changed and reduced the, reduced the insulin dose, then her blood glucose will go high. The opposite will be if we treat the patients according to the profile of day two, that means the blood glucose was high, we're gonna increase the basal insulin dose, 
in day one, she will crash. So it's clear that the variability of the glycemic profile of our patients, which is actually living, is what is preventing our patients to get to better glycemic control with MDI uh, during the daily, daily uh, uh, routine. So how do the patients solve this problem of having a program that either they, with the physicians, with the nurses, with the dietitians, their regimen of therapy that was given to them does not match what they need during the day. How do they deal with this? Very simply, they try to correct our mistakes. How do they correct our mistakes? They do multiple MBGs. So we were not surprised to see these studies from the U.S. looking at the correlation between the number of SMBG done with A1C uh, uh, obtained. Patients who are obtaining an A1C that is lower than 7, which is our target, had more than 10 SMBG associated with this. More than 10. I don't know how many of you ever did an SMBG. 10 times a day is a lot. Then comes the flash scanning. Great invention for the patients. No more finger pricks. What we can see is that the, the issue is to associate with the A1C in target, let's say 6.8. How many scans are associated with obtaining such a, even not the physiological, but close to what we want our patients to be? So if you look at 6.8 A1C, you can see that it is associated with over 30 scans a day. Now, to scan is two minutes, right? Or no, it's, it's seconds. But looking at the blood glucose level, deciding if we need to do anything with this, and what are the circumstances? Should we give more? Should we less? How much does it take? Even if those patients are really, really well experienced, two to three minutes, Multiply it by 30, 40, you see the burden of the patients on how to treat, how to treat their diabetes. So real-time sensing seems to be something that might help the patients because they do not need to be scanning all the time. The information is in their hand, but we can see that even though it is, seems to be a way to help the patients control the glycemia, still the uh, use of CGM in the type 1 exchange still seems to be lagging behind pumps and actually around less than 25 of the patients are using this in countries where there is reimbursement by the different insurance uh, 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 plans. It was no wonder that a couple of uh, months ago, a group of, of esteemed physicians from the U.S. actually defined that in order to have our patients be better controlled and trying to reduce the variability of the variation in the glycemic control, CGM should be the major standard of care for patients of type 1 diabetes. CGM should be the standard of care for type 1 diabetes, and maybe some patients with type 2 diabetes who are using multiple, uh, multiple daily injections. Do we have evidence, actually, that going from SMBG and trying to use real-time CGM actually helps patients on MDI improve their glycemic control by reducing the variability. Well, the first large control studies done here, this is the uh, Diamond study, 161 patients, 158 patients for six months, looking at the data, putting patients on MDI with an A1C of above 7.5, using the Dexcom G4, shown a remarkable reduction of A1C of around 0.6 percentage patients MDI switching or uh, uh, comparing patients on MDI with SMBG versus CGM. This reduction of A1C 
was not associated with increase in hypoglycemia, actually with a slight reduction in hypoglycemia, and it reduced the variability from 45% time in range to around 51%. CGM reduces A1C in patients with MDI without increasing hypoglycemia in patients with an A1C of above 7.5. The gold study, as done in by both Europe and US, actually the same number of patients, actually the same profile of patients of A1C of 7.5, a bit different design of study, came very close to the same results using again the G4 of a reduction of 0.4 in A1C, again, not increasing hypoglycemia, reducing the variability from 39% to 42%, I mean, reducing the variability and increasing the time in range to 42%, but what we learned here from the study, which was a crossover, was something that was new to some, but already had been hinted before in other studies, like the SWITCH study, in which the real-time information that the patient has is not retained when the patient is off the real-time CGM. We all thought that using real-time CGM for a period of time will educate the patients and make them smarter or more experience or to know what to avoid. But look what happens when the patient is on real-time CGM, there is a reduction in the improvement in glycemic control. Once you take it away, it goes back close to the basal situation or uh, yeah, to the baseline situation. Pointing to the fact that if you are using real-time CGM, you need to use it all the time. In this case, it's type 1 diabetes, A1C above 7.5. Having this proof that in randomized controlled study, real-time CGM improves glycemic control. The Guardian Connect did not do a randomized control study, but having them able to download automatically the data from the device through the phone, for the iPhone, we can follow patients' control remotely with more and more patients using the device. Now, this is not a randomized control study, so we don't know the data or the specific information on the specific patients. So what we were looking at was what is the time in range that the patients were able to arrive to, to obtain, and also if it's sustainable. Because we've seen that not using the real-time CGM can sometimes have patients be on control, not using it, lose control. So we're looking at patients, 258 patients for more than nine months, looking at the sustainability of their improvement. We can see that using real-time CGM with the Guardian Connect can put patients in quite well control in a sustainable way. We don't know which patients they are. So they could be type one, type two. So you cannot compare time and range from the different different studies. What, what the point is to show that the result is sustainable because everybody, everybody questions the, the long-term effect of having an app. You can see that many apps in the health uh, arena are helpful for a short term. Here, nine months, sustainable results. So the point is, in real-time CGM is that we should go beyond just giving patients data. As we've seen, patients with flash needs to do 30, 40 times. Just giving data to patients increases the load. The issue was, when will be the effect if the patients will be aware of the data at the time that they need to do something to prevent a mishap. They don't need to be aware all the time of their glycemic level. They need to be alerted to those levels that might be leading to a either a severe hypo or a hypo or a large hyperglycemic event. That is why the important was, should we put in an algorithm that predicts 
glycemic control. So if the patient is going to have a mishap in the future, alert the patient and let the patient deal with it, not when they're hypo or hyper, but before. That was, I think, Laurent meant the power of prediction. So here is a, the most important slide, not nice, but a lot of information because I need a minute of your concentration here. We were looking here at if the patient is setting a prediction alarm saying, I want to know in advance, either I'm going to hypo and he and his physician or his healthcare professional decides what is the set point. So if I am setting my device to alert before hypo or to alert before hyper, will this actually prevent these actions? A very nice study just came up from Ulm, from Germany. I don't know if it, it, it was somebody's in the audience from that center. And they're saying, listen, when we do trends, when somebody's using, using real-time CGM and we say there's two arrows going up, or there is a trend of hyper, is it true? What are, because we're saying, if you have two arrows going up, that means you're gonna be in the next 30 minutes higher. But it's not based on the future, it's based on the past. How do you know that what happened in the past 30 minutes will reflect what's gonna go in the future? You're going now to alert patients that they're gonna be in hyper and hypo, that they need to do something to prevent this hyper or hypo. How do you know you're actually gonna be in hyper? Maybe you're just alerting them all the time and bothering them. This was a very interesting uh, uh, study, was looking at the data from a data scientist, and this is what they found out. So they were looking at, they were matching Cases, real cases of patients who had an alert before high or before low, and looked how many of these patients actually reached the set point that we wanted to prevent. That means if we had a patient who wanted to avoid, avoid going below 60 milligrams per deciliter, and he was setting the alarm, if the alert was set, did we actually prevent reaching this hypoglycemic levels? And what would, and they matched it to patients who did not use alerts, but actually just looking at tracing and saying, what ha really happened in this patient who, if we could have a alert at that time, will he reach this hypoglycemia level that he wanted to prevent? Bit complicated, but let's see the results. Let's look on the hypoglycemia part. No, let's start in the hyperglycemia, it's easier. But what we can find out that if the patient set a hyperglycemia predictive alert in 39% of the time, that means for almost 40% of the time, the patients did not reach that high level. This high level was prevented. 60% they did not, were unable to prevent this. Maybe they did not act to the alert. But 39% of the cases that the patient had an alert before hyper, he did not reach the high level. What does that mean? What would happen if he did not have an alert? So this is the interesting data coming here that only 10% of the cases are false positive. That means not having the alert you would have not reached the hyperglycemia levels in 10%. Having the alert, you avoid almost 40%, that is three times as much. Showing two points. Having a predictive alert really predicts what it needs to predict, going into that excursion that you want to prevent, and having the alert on actually prevents patients 40% from reaching that level. But then you're gonna ask me if you do, but 60% do reach this level. So you helped a bit. What more can we get from this data? And this is the next bar up here. We can see that if you do reach a hyperglycemia excursion, when you have the alerts on, it's gonna be shorter 
less severe than if you don't have the alerts. That means the alerts for high prevents getting to the excursions and those excursions you do reach are shorter. Let's go to the other side and let's look at the low uh, uh, glucose predictive alert. Here we see it's a bit different because here when you have a predictive low alert you prevent 60% of the time reaching this hypoglycemia but patients who do not have alerts 33 of the, the alerts 33 of the situation that would have triggered an alert do not reach that level that means maybe 33% are false positive but it maybe means that the patients felt and changed the the, uh, the the event so we don't know that but still having a alert before low actually prevents the majority of cases of reaching this threshold that we don't want to reach and it's at least twice as much as when uh, uh, prevented in the cases that they don't have the alerts on but again once they do reach this hypoglycemia in the 40 percent it is much 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 shorter that means less uh, dangerous than uh, uh, if you don't have the alert on which is very very uh, uh, persuasive that there is a need to there is a, a a place for prediction in using prediction alerts now for those who would like to see it more visual we're able to track the hypoglycemias that are triggered and see where are the when when it actually reaches a hypoglycemia and when it is actually prevented so when there is a hypoglycemia event that is prevented it's in the green dot when it's not prevented it's in the red dot and actually it works so you can see all the greens are centers where you have a patient who was prevented the hypoglycemia here and there you see the red ones just a nice presentation of preventing hypoglycemia somehow it looks very nice in this in this map you can see the countries who are using the guardian connect and some countries that still it's not it's haven't passed the regulatory uh, approval like I don't want to well, I don't want to mention specific countries but you can see the countries where they're using it more versus the countries or using it less all right sorry about this here we go the last insights that we had from our patients using real-time CGM with prediction alerts points that physicians and patients starts to get it what I mean start to get it when we are using predictive when you use alerts only on high on only on low it's too late our teaching when we teach physicians and we teach patients we want them to change the map to change the way that they're treating their alerts by reducing the, num the number of alerts that they have on high and low and increasing the preventive alerts because the more you have the more you deal with a situation before it happens you prevent the situation from happening and does it show now this is the first time we're going to show this data and we're comparing the population from 2009 from uh, 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 oh here it is from January 2017 3,000 patients to October 2018 almost the same 2,556 patients we can see there is a changing trend in the use of alerts here we can see number one high alerts number two low alerts and we see some predictive alerts turned on before high and before low this is the first time we see a change in in, in the tide okay we still see not enough use of the before high but for the low because that's where the patients are afraid and feel much comfort much more comfortable they are using much more the before low sorry about this uh, I'm, I'm taking away your your presentation am i good uh, 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 is this uh, this the back don't don't look don't look don't look don't look don't look here we go here we go 
So we see the changing of the tide getting the first time the before low alerts are getting over. First of all, there's less alerts and the before low alerts are getting higher the first time than the on low alerts. And still we might discuss later on why the, the, the trend of uh, alerts are not used more. So pointing to the fact, first of all, that we can show using the predictive alert, the power of prediction prevents mishaps and also it changes changes a bit the uh, the way the uh, the the, uh, uh, the patients are dealing with the alerts and their behavior. The first case comes from South Africa. It's a 15 years old boy that was newly diagnosed when he was uh, taking a trip to uh, South Africa from uh, where he lives, he resides in Central Africa. And he had this, uh, the classic symptoms of a new onset, presented with EKA, had difficulties to control his BGs, and was started with a M MDI uh, regimen of Traceba, 24 units, and Novo Rapid already, sophisticated uh, functional insulin therapy with carb ratios and correction factors, and the blood glucose target of six millimoles. Everything is nice and well. Put him on the Guardian Connect to be able to be also following it with the fam family, but also to uh, continuously monitor his blood glucose. So the first question when you have to decide is to be very careful and very stingy on which types of alerts you want the patients to have. Because too much alerts is going to be alert fatigue. They're going to disregard the alerts. So each alert that you choose needs to be medically decided by the team if it is important or if it's not important. So the question is, which type, what are the levels that you think are, are, uh, are important? What is the levels of the high? What are the levels of the low that you want the patients to do? In this case, the physician chose nine millimoles from during, uh, in the daytime, 12 millimoles during the nighttime, and only to be alerted on high, not alerted before high, because the main concern was hypoglycemia and not hyperglycemia. Would that be a choice that you would choose for the first patients in the first days? Probably. You don't want to alert them, you just make him sure that he's not going again too high, maybe omitting insulin. For the low alerts, it was chosen for you, for uh, millimoles, makes sense, but the patient family decided not just to put the alert on and the physician, but actually use the alert before low. That makes sense on the first decision to put the patients on, on, a, 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 on a system, on the Guardian Connect, is having a high, a very high level for the for the high alerts, but more more uh, to be more careful in the hypoglycemia. What happens two weeks on the Guardian Connect? So first of all, using the Guardian Connect, unlike patients who are doing MDI without uh, SMBG or if only SMBG, you get some more insights if they're using the markers on how many blood glucose they take, if they're doing manual boluses. But remember, this is not correct, uh, collected automatically. The patient needs to put it in. That's why this data is important, but we have to take it with a grain of salt because it is not automatically uploaded. But you can see the patient is actually bolusing. We can see the total daily insulin according to what the patient has, has uh, 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 put into the system, but actually the patient is not in good control with time in range, only 25% looking at the SMBGs. How does the CGM data look after two weeks? Where is the main issue of concern? What do we understand from the patient's download? In this case, Having real-time CGM can really point you to whether you put the right parameters for the alerts in the correct way or you need to change. You can see what is the high issue. The high issue is actually covered by the patient's 12 millimoles high alert, 
But what we can see that more than once, the patient has a very steep, high rate of change, ending up in hyperglycemia. Here, 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 and here. This probably hints to a problem that, especially in the beginning of the patient's, uh, 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 when he starts having type 1 diabetes at, at onset, is missing missing boluses. What is a way that we can use the Guardian Connect in order to alert the patient that he is actually missing boluses, but earlier than when he already has the high blood glucose of 10 or 12? What can we do best in order to prevent patient or remind the patient that he is forgetting to bolus? We'll see the solution of the physician in a minute. Again, this is the first two weeks on Guardian Connect, not well controlled, a lot of variability, and there you can see the increase and decrease rate of change in many cases showing the patient is actually not bolusing before meal and actually correcting after the, after the effect. So what can we learn from the patient's downloads with the Guardian Connect? First of all, patient is actually doing some things that we need to encourage him. So stress the positives. The patient is measuring twice a day. He does bolus for meals. He's not totally omitting boluses. And he does react before low and to avoid hypoglycemia, but that sometimes it is an overcorrection, overcorrection when he's in hypo. What do we need to do? Tell the patient, uh, what we, well, the issues we see that the patient is not bolusing or does not bolus on time and does not react to alert on high to admin, administer correction. What is the corrective action you do with the patient is, first of all, decreasing the treceba to 21 units. We're not going to discuss if it's right or wrong. This is the physician's decision. It's a real case. But stressing to the patient that the meal bolus should be 10 to 15 minutes before eating. Use the bolus calculator. That means a, an app that he can use, but changing some of the alerts. So two things the, the, uh, the physician added. One is information that when you have alerts on high, alerts on high give an correction dose of two units, and when you have an alert during the night, which you are above 12, give four units. The point is not if it's correct or not correct. The point is that now as physicians who are treating patients with the Guardian Connect, we need to give them some more information what to do with the information. So just saying the patient, oh, you have a high during the night, what should you do? He needs to know what to do because he was never confronted with this before. But what did the patient, what, is, what did the healthcare professional did? Not just turning on the alerts and teaching the patient what to do. She, always, she also turned on the rise alert limits. This is the case which actually you do want to have the patient be alerted when there is a steep change because when do you have such a increase of rate of change of more than two milligrams per deciliter for a minute is when you miss a bolus. Having this alert on might prevent and remind the patient earlier after missing the bolus to correct it before reaching the high blood glucose level. Did these changes work? Well, the optimistics will say, fantastic, it did show a, a significant reduction in the, in the glycemic variability and better control. We can see that patients spend more, more time in the uh, range, and uh, 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 you see much less increases in increases, much less variability, some increases in a bit hypoglycemic range that we need to be addressed. 
So what we saw is that using the alerts and gaining some insights from the real-time CGM, you can increase the timing range. You can actually reinforce some educational and the those who are skeptic will say most of the improvement was maybe getting out of the uh, glycemic uh, uh, toxicity and going into a more honeymoon period. But the patient actually learned to pre-bolus and reacting to time alerts on high admission correction uh, 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 with the new recommendations. So I just wanted to show you uh, 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 the questions that you will be confronted if you are using this kind of a, a app with your patients. So the first question is usually brought up by the patient is, what are the set points that you're going to choose from the beginning, which you need to decide. Are you going to use 60, below 60, and so on? How do you decide this? According to the patient's fears, according to his clinical and medical condition. If he has a heart condition, you want to make it more uh, uh, less prone to hypoglycemia. And if it's according to the age, you have to change the different levels. The next question is, which setting would you choose? Alert on low or alert before low? All the time, not all the time. Those are the questions that I go through my mind before setting every alert to make sure that this alert has a good medical reasoning before turning it on because I know that every alert is a burden on our patients. Last is the alerts before low. How long before? How much time do we give the patients to interact and prevent? We heard uh, Laurent discuss 20 minutes. Should you do it 15 minutes, 30 minutes? Usually the set point we recommend is between 20 and 30 minutes because we have shown from the data that having this alert at that time will be able to prevent going from uh, uh, preventing going into the excursion either high or either low. So for the next case, Professor Gies, can you join me here if it's okay with you? Would you run us through Stephanie? So the next case is, um, is a 16-year-old female who has diabetes for already five years. Um, she's on MDI and she um, counts carbs. She uses a bolus calculator, but most of the times she forgets the bolus. And she's really afraid of hypos. And that is the reason why she's not wanting to bolus all the time. Her A1C, when she does the consultation, is, is way too high. It's 8.9. Um, and so we, we discussed with her that we had to find a solution on how to convince her on giving boluses um, and, and um, treating this, this extreme fear of hypo. So even though she never had a severe hypo, she was panicked every time that she saw that her blood glucose was at about a value of 80 or 85. It was already too low for her. So we decided to put her on a Guardian Connect, and these are her first um, uh, data on Guardian Connect. So as you can see, it's not good at all. Um, there's a lot of things to discuss with her. Um, this is the overview of the first week, and here you can see uh, even the day-by-day -day, uh, reliability uh, and the way she uses her, her, um, her boluses and her sensor. So what we saw at this time is that usually she is, um, she is measuring, she is calibrating, she is using the sensor, but there is an extreme variability. She's going from high to low, um, not really into lows, but she does have these, these steep uh, changes um, when she eventually corrects herself and, and, and gives a correction bolus. But most of the time, she's in hypo, as you can see here, all the time. 
So what we discussed with her, uh, according to the first uh, information that we have, is that she is really doing a, some good efforts as well. She is already calibrating. She is using the sensor. She is uh, willing to, to, to manage her diabetes and to do something about it. Um, and um, she wants to do something as soon as the sugar, sugar level goes down. She wants to be able to do something. She really would like to have an alert to prevent her sugar from uh, decreasing. On the other hand, there are a lot of issues as well. So she's way too high, and especially during the night, she is too high. She does forget to bolus as well. It's not only the fear of hypo, but it's also the adolescent who's not bolusing. Um, she's not giving correction boluses. And um, when she calibrates, it's not always at the good time. Sometimes she just calibrates because she gets an alert, but then it's not on the right moment, and then there is no sensor data anymore, or she needs to recalibrate again. And then she sometimes gives up on using the sensor for 24 hours or even longer. So here, what we discussed with her as uh, recommendations is that we put her on a Guardian Connect, and we discussed the alarms. As just mentioned by Professor Cohen, we had an, a real um, negotiation with the patient. Usually, we set uh, hypo alarm alerts at a lower value, but in her case, we decided to put the hypo alert at 80 milligram per deciliter because she was so afraid of going too low. So we decided this to start at the first time with a higher alert, and then the idea was to gradually decrease the setting to a lower alert. We also decided not to set any hyper alarm because she didn't want to have too many alarms. Uh, she's at school. She doesn't want to get bothered all the time. And she, she and we as well decided to go first on the hypofear, trying to get rid of the variability on and trying to enforce him and to, to stimulate her to give correction boluses and then to deal with the hypers in a second time. What we also did is we used the Guardian Connect and the Guardian Connect data to, to really follow her on an intensive way. So we used the data coming in as a remote monitoring way, way. and we called her every two weeks and sometimes even more frequent. Um, most of the time it was kind of a pep talk, it was the nurse trying to convince her to give correction boluses and pointing out that at specific days, at specific data, showing her that even when she did give a bolus, she wasn't going into hypoglycemia and thus stimulating her to increase the amount of boluses that she needed to give. As you can see as well, we didn't only set an alarm on, on uh, hypo, but also a predictive alarm before hypo. Again, because there was this extreme fear of hypos that we wanted to cover. And then this is what happened three months later. It is not perfect at all, but you could see that there is an improvement. Um, there is, there were better nights. There is a slightly decrease in variability. We still have no hypos, which was very important for her. Um, she is Every now and then, forgetting to bolus at, uh, at meal time. But at that time, we changed the alerts. We lowered the hypo alarm from 80 to 70. And we, um, we also set the hyper alerts to uh, prevent her from forgetting to bolus. Because at this time, she was willing to add additional insulin and to bolus uh, whenever she was going high. Um, you can also see that when you go to the day-by-day -day report that she's, she's um, even starting to use the Guardian Connect better and better. In the beginning, she didn't have time. She didn't want to put too many effort and too many time in, um, in letting us know or letting herself know at what time she had eaten and when she was going to have some physical activity. But now, little by little, she is every now and then putting in some additional information. And uh, after the short from 8.9 to 7.5%, which of course reinforced her again in you know, the effort that she had been going through for the last few months. This was any questions on that? 
And then there is a second case from, from Belgium. It's a boy, um, 15 year old, also an adolescent, who also has five years of type 1 diabetes, also on MDI. Uh, he's supposed to count coughs and to uh, inject himself at every meal. Uh, but he hasn't got time for diabetes. He has a lot of other issues to deal with and a lot of other stuff to do. Um, so he has an A1C of 9.1, unfortunately. So again, if in this boy, the, we really needed to find a way to, to deal with his hypoglycemia. And with the way he was dealing with his diabetes, we needed to find a way to motivate him uh, to address more time on his diabetes. So we decided to put him on a Guardian Connect as well. Again, as you can see, this is the starting values, really high values throughout the day, a little bit better in the evening and during the night. A really high variability going from high to low all the time throughout the day. Um, and again, here, when you look to his data from day to day, you can see that there was a lot of missing data as well. Sometimes he doesn't use his Guardian Connect Health Sensor for, for several uh, days. So what we see is that what is striking uh, and what we see in a lot of our adolescents is that here, this is his best period of the day. And how does it come when that's the, the moment when he comes home from school and mom and dad are there? and they are asking him about his glycemia, and they uh, stress him or they force him to inject a correction bonus. So whenever somebody is reminding him of his diabetes, um, he is dealing with it on a, on a better way and on a correct way. So in the evening, the values are better, but the, the main issue is the hypoglycemia, uh, especially during daytime. Sometimes there are hypoglycemias, especially when at a certain time, he's been high for a long time, and he decides to do something about it, and then without properly counting, he just injects himself 20 units or, or 25 units. There's a lack of calibrations and incorrect timing, again, of calibrations, which is, which is um, a big issue in these uh, adolescents. So on top of putting him on the Guardian Connect, we discussed with him that we would suggest to uh, start with some alarm set alert settings. He agreed on putting some uh, alerts for calibrations and for missed calibrations, uh, also for hyperglycemia. Um, and then, in case of, high, of, an, of an overcorrection, he said that he agreed on having the alerts as well pre hypo. We also decided to decrease the correction bonuses. We instructed him again on how to. Um, use a bonus calculator on how to calculate proper doses instead of just guessing. Um, and as you can see, a couple of months later, it worked as well uh, with, this, uh, with this boy. His nights are much better. And even during the daytime, uh, especially in the morning and at school, he boluses more often now because of the alerts, the hyper alerts that he's having. Um, also, when you take a look at the day-to-day -day use, there are more data. Of course, they are not perfect yet. It's only four months later. But we see a more constant use of the, of the CGM, less missed calibrations, and, and uh, a lot more data to discuss with him. We decided this was the first issue that we wanted to have enough data, and from there on, we can start this, the discussion with this, uh, with this boy. And also, in this boy, we had a really um, nice drop of A1C from 9.1 to 7.9 percent. Please wait to. So thank you for paying close attention to the presentations. I hope you enjoyed the content of the presentations. So we are now starting the question and answer session. First, we will go through the questions that have been asked during the webinar. However, if you still have questions, you can type it in the YouTube chat. So let's begin with the first question. Is the Guardian Connect safe and effective in the pediatric population. The safety and efficacy of Guardian Connect 
has been studied in a pediatric population in a study involving more than 150 participants. It was a multi-center study involving 11 investigational sites in the United States and the Europe. The study found out that the Guardian Connect is safe and effective for use in the pediatric population and the Indian regulatory label allows Guardian Connect to be used in the pediatric population. The second question, what are the various components of the Guardian Connect system? The Guardian Connect system involves a sensor, which is an light sensor that is available in India. However, sooner we'll get a new sensor, the more advanced sensor, which is Guardian Sensor 3. The Guardian Connect transmitter, which transmits the data from sensor to the mobile app. And the final component is the mobile app. So with these three components, the patients can start using Guardian Connect system. The third question is, what is the positive predictive value for the low glucose and high glucose readings? So for the low glucose readings, the positive predictive value is 94.8%. That means if the Guardian Connect system alerts the user that the low glucose event is going to happen, that means with 94.8% accuracy, the low glucose event will happen. For the high glucose readings, the positive predictive value is 36.6%. This data will be published soon. So this is the data on file that shows that the Guardian Connect's accuracy or the positive predictive value is very high, particularly for the low glucose readings. The next question is, can we do the remote monitoring with the Guardian Connect system? So Guardian Connect system allows you to monitor the patients remotely, as well as for caretakers, it is a boon because it allows up to five caretakers to monitor the glucose data anywhere around the world using the web. So the only requirement is the internet connection. So that is a very great advantage or the, I would say very important advantage, particularly when you are monitoring the patients. The fifth question is, do we need to start all the alerts when we are starting the patient on Guardian Connect system? So the answer is no, you don't need to switch on all the alerts when you start the patient on Guardian Connect system because it may lead to alert fatigue. So what we recommend or advice is that you can start with the alerts where the patient is comfortable with. So maybe the alert before low, alert on low and the alert before high. So these are the three recommended alerts that you can start with. And then based on the patient comfort, you can turn on the additional alerts. The next question is, can it be used only in the type one diabetes patients? So the answer is no, it can still be used in the patients with type two diabetes patient, particularly the elderly patients or the patients who are on multiple daily injections requiring close monitoring. Now in this kind of patients, it may be really helpful in preventing hypoglycemia as well as helping the doctors to adjust the doses by remotely monitoring the patient. So I personally believe is that it's a great tool, not only for type one diabetes patients, but also for the type two patients. So with this, we are closing the webinar for today. We really thank all the participants for spending their precious time listening to the webinar and I hope you enjoyed the content. See you soon with our next webinar. Thank you and have a nice evening.